Um, so I, I'm, I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Stephen Scotham. Um, uh, I've been enjoying some really uh, constructive and helpful conversations with Stephen for, for a few months now. Um, Stephen is a visiting reader at Christ Church, at Canterbury Christ Church um, University uh, here in the UK. He was president of the Geographical Association between 2018 and 19. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see this very well because I will be very small on your screens now, but he has written a book with his colleague, Steve Rawlinson, who's also here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but here it is. It's called Sustainability Education, a Classroom Guide. I thoroughly uh, recommend it. Um, and at the last meeting, uh, it was suggested by quite a few people, actually, that we needed to, um, uh, to look a little bit beyond history um, and think about other perspectives, geography being an obvious one, although I know Stephen's going to talk about geography and history. Um, so, so Stephen was an obvious person to, to, to bring in, although Stephen is a geographer, uh, he's really a passionate advocate for the role of, of the humanities in general in, in thinking about climate change and sustainability issues. Um, so it's great to have him here. And, and also we wanted someone who has written widely on primary education. Um, so Stephen ticks lots of boxes for us uh, today. And we're really, really grateful, Stephen. So I will pass over to you if that's OK. And um, thank you again. Well, I'm delighted to be here and uh, looking forward to sharing some thoughts. It's a huge canvas uh, linking geography, history and sustainability education. I chose that picture to begin with, really, because it is a historic, uh, a scene from a historic woodland, uh, which obviously looks back to the history side of things. Uh, from a geography point of view, it's about sense of place. And from a sustainability point of view, it's about valuing our environment and our interrelationships with the environment. So that's where I'm going to try and explore that in different ways over the next half hour or so, and then hopefully got some time for questions and so on. And that's the uh, the book which uh, is behind this, as it were, and which uh, in a way, this was a sort of COVID project, which I developed with my friend and colleague, Steve Rawlinson, who is here today. And we wanted to both set out the theory and the practice of sustainability education and what that might mean. And uh, we've done our very best to do that in, in, in it's quite a difficult thing to bring together the theory and the practice. And I think there's a lot of material on the theory, but not so much on what does that actually mean and how do you, what is it to be sustainability literate in the different age grains, whether you're seven, nine or 11 or so on. And what does it mean uh, in terms of school organization and so on? So uh, it, it's we gather some ideas together in this book. And one of the key messages that is that sustainability relates to and is part of all school subjects. And that's what we try to argue. So uh, a number of questions which I'm going to explore. First of all, how do we get here? How do we get here in a metaphysical sense? How can education respond to the circumstances we find ourselves in the current environmental crisis? What's very briefly, a very brief swipe as it were, a very brief uh, few thoughts on what's the role of history in all this and what's the role of geography? And so I'll take uh, that bit by bit. So my first slide takes us into deep time and uh, we know we've got to go back 4,600 million years. It just sort of trips off the tongue, but it's a vast uh, period of time that the planet has been evolving and changing and developing into its present state. And if you think of that deep time in terms of uh, a, a calendar year, uh, all the things which are, are so pressing nowadays have developed and have happened in the last one and a half seconds of the last day of the year. And so we've got uh, that just sort of uh, puts deep time into some sort of perspective. And uh, it, the evolution of life itself is, is a comparatively, you know, sort of only part of that very, very long story. And yet within that, um, we are at a point now where we're talking about the Anthropocene, about a, a, a human uh, uh, dominated and a human constructed geological epoch. Um, and it's a, it's a proposition. It's, it's, there's a lot of discussion around whether the Anthropocene is a, a viable term, uh, it, given the enormous length and breadth of geological history. Uh, and is it uh, an act of humility, uh, of hubris rather than humility, uh, to 
think of uh, human activity is in at all significant on that deep time scale. Uh, and you can see here, this is just the evolution of life. This is just the last 600 million years or so. That's, uh, 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 again, just a few months on the uh, 24, uh, on, on the on the 365 day uh, time clock. So we're, we're talking about the Anthropocene, but we need to talk about it with a certain amount of caution and recognize you need a with, way? Hu with humility okay. where we are. So moving on, uh, in very recent time, within my <laughs> lifetime, uh, yeah. things have changed. Things have changed uh, dramatically. And uh, whereas in the 1950s, I wonder okay. if there's a, somebody who's got their mic. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, yeah. would you mind uh, muting, um, please? Right, there's a little bit of interruption from Elizabeth, thank you. Um, thank uh, you. Uh, we, we, even within my lifetime, since the 1950s, all the graphs, as it were, of, of economic activity and uh, uh, human activity generally have absolutely gone off the scale exponentially. And you can see whether you take the population of the planet, whether you take fertilizer production, water consumption, energy use, and so on, they're all telling the same story. And just to sort of uh, uh, have one sort of snapshot on that, uh, the cement production and consumption in China in the first couple of years of the present century uh, was about the same as what the US used in the whole of the 20th century. And we all know that cement production is uh, uh, creates huge quantities of, of, of carbon uh, dioxide and is a, a highly polluting activity. So um, this, I can spend too long on sketching out where we are, uh, but the great acceleration is uh, a, a key notion in trying to make sense of where we are and what, what, what the issues are and why we need to respond in a qualitatively different way uh, to uh, the way that we have done to other situations. Uh, one of the notions which concentrates the mind is the notion of planetary boundaries and tipping points. This particularly comes from the Stockholm Resilience Center, but um, you can see very clearly, this is already many years, uh, uh, nearly a decade out of date, but you can see the climate crisis, the nitrogen cycle, and the biodiversity loss are all uh, well over the, uh, in, into the red zone, as it were, and lots of other uh, key indicators are looking uh, rather dodgy. They all interrelate, they're not to be taken individually. And one of the tricky things about the whole notion of tripping points is that it's not obvious where you've actually got to them. Um, the calculation is that if you take the Paris Accord of 1.5 degrees temperature rise, uh, if we're going to hold within that, then the carbon budget, uh, if you look at then the carbon budget that matches 1.5 degrees, we're already nine tenths of the way there. And by about 2030, we will be at the 1.5 point on the carbon budget, which is itself highly dangerous because it triggers or could potentially trigger irreversible runaway effects. So there's all sorts of reasons to feel very worried about where we are and to recognize that it is a very significant moment. An interesting uh, view on this comes from Kate Rayworth, who says, well, we've got the ecological ceiling, uh, we've got the overshoot, which we've just seen in all the tipping points, but underpinning that, we also need to look at the social foundation uh, and, and the conditions of, for uh, uh, humanity generally, and need to try and position ourselves in that ring, that green ring, which she calls the safe and just space for humanity, where we live within our ecological ceiling, but, uh, but equally uh, secure our social foundation so that the maximum number of people have the chance to live decent lives on the planet that supports us. So that's a, a really interesting thought. And she uh, sort of throws down the gauntlet and says, just imagine if ours could be the turnaround generation that started putting humanity back on the track for a globally sustainable future. And putting ourselves back on the track means turning those graphs down round that we saw in the Great Acceleration, turning those graphs back and so that they're no longer going up exponentially, but beginning to come down and coming down very rapidly. Uh, we know this is a, a problem. It's 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 widespread news nowadays, and uh, I think uh, well across the world, people have, as it were, in the last five years, really woken up to the scale and the importance of this. Uh, the uh, foreign minister of Tuvalu here talking to the COP26 uh, conference uh, uh, from the ocean 
uh, the first nation in the world that could well disappear. Uh, and of course, now in COP27, we've got a, a recognition of the uh, moral responsibility and the historic responsibility for the more developed nations of the world towards uh, other countries which uh, haven't contributed uh, significantly to the problem, which are actually reaping uh, uh, or, or in the firing line uh, uh, from the consequences. So the moral dimension of this comes up very clearly. Uh, international responses to date. Well, a few uh, uh, key uh, reports. Uh, here's one from uh, the, what is the address at COP27 by Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General. The global climate fight will be won or lost in this crucial decade. Humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. I mean, these are, these are stark warnings. Uh, this is the Living Planet report, again, came out very recently. The message is clear and the lights are flashing red. We know what's happening, we know the risks, and we know the solutions. And lastly, uh, something here, which I think is, from an educational point of view uh, that we need to take heart from, we are confident that education is a powerful enabler of positive change of mindsets and worldviews, and that can support all dimensions of sustainable development and well-being. And uh, the Berlin uh, Declaration is wrapped around and uh, supportive of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which um, you'll probably all be familiar with, uh, these 17 goals uh, for living within planetary means and securing a soft, soft, safe and just place for humanity, which recognises the biosphere, life on Earth and life in water, as two absolutely fundamental uh, targets uh, and uh, puts partnership uh, at the very top of the, of the pyramid, as it were, or, or, uh, and, and economy and society in between. So 17 targets, which uh, people around the world are getting behind. So there is a crisis, it's an urgent crisis. How can we respond to this as educationists? A few thoughts there, and then I'll go on to history and geography. So uh, the educational response is a need to bridge the reality gap between what's actually going on at the moment and what the circumstances suggest uh, that we need to be doing. And so what I suppose we are all involved with and, and can contribute towards is identifying, constructing and putting in place uh, uh, the girders which will help to bridge that chasm. And individually, we may just be contributing a rivet. We may just be contributing a, 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 an operative on a spanner or whatever, but between us, we need to construct that edifice that's going to take us across the chasm that we know exists. What do children actually want? What do we know? Well, the big ask, which was conducted a couple of years ago now by the Children's Commissioner, uh, which involved a huge number of children from all sorts of different walks of life and was highly representative, uh, highlighted two main concerns. One was well-being and mental health, and the other one was the protection of the environment. And that seems to be replicated in all sorts of other surveys. But I just put that on the table to say this is what children want. And equally, uh, if you look at YouGov polls, uh, uh, these are the sort of headings that come out. Young people feel that their education doesn't provide them with the necessary knowledge and skills to understand climate change. And you could begin to say, well, why not? Over 90% would like to see their schooling do more to engage them with it. And interestingly, perhaps this is part of the why not, only 18% of primary and secondary school teachers feel they've received adequate training. And so that takes us into uh, uh, that um, more uh, I don't know, uh, uh, policy area of uh, how do we see that we've got uh, empowered children and, uh, uh, and teachers who feel confident and able to face the very difficult challenge and negotiate the very difficult challenges of talking about these things. Some of the barriers, uh, we can easily slip into doom mongering. We can easily uh, spawn unnecessary sense of uh, anxiety and grief among children, our own lack of expertise as a, as a profession and institutional inertia. I think it was uh, uh, Estelle Morris who said that turning education around was like turning around an oil tanker. You know, it takes a, a quarter of a mile after you've turned the rudder for anything to happen. And yet alone turning the 
thing around. And of course, one of our problems is that we've got a, a system of government which uh, chops and changes. And so that oil tanker uh, plows on, uh, uh, but the, uh, the uh, rudder may then be uh, rusted in a different direction before anything's really happened. But enablers, there are lots of them. And at the moment, I get the feeling that there's a, a, a tremendous amount of energy in talking around uh, 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 the crisis which people are identifying in education and the way that we go about it. We may not have reached uh, the point where there's a critical mass to make the changes happen, but certainly that conversation is happening in lots and lots of different places. Uh, one of the things which we can bring to the table here is the recognition of the importance of different types of knowing. Uh, the man mantra head, heart, hands uh, is one way of looking at this. And um, Satish Kumar, the um, editor of Resurgence and environmental campaigner, makes the point wonderfully that he says that uh, te teachers very often, uh, and indeed the education system very often, thinks of children as just a brain. Uh, and that's all they see. They forget that they're looking at a whole child. They're looking at that they forget that learning is involves the body as well as the, the brain. They forget uh, that um, experience is so important in learning and it's through that learning, through that, that uh, different types of learning happen. And um, in fact, Satish goes further and says, actually, you only see half a brain quite often because you're looking at a, a particular type of a mental process, which is often left brain thinking, that sort of accountancy and bean counting side of the brain, that sort of a, uh, ability to be precise and, and, and so on. But the big worldview bit of the brain, the right brain, is often neglected. Uh, and I, I, one of the things that happens, if I want to argue, that if you engage children holistically, not only does it uh, uh, open the door to different ways of learning, but it also opens the door to different ways of being and a, and a sense of uh, greater uh, health and well-being and, and hope is one of the key things that comes out of this. And that's the balancing act that we need to pull off is to be honest and truthful at the moment uh, and to provide children with ways in which they can learn about what's going on and they can develop the imagination and the skills and the confidence that they need to be resilient in the face of whatever it is that the future is going to throw at them. In our book, we've uh, uh, come up with a whole range of different topics and themes in an attempt to try and put some sort of sequencing into, into uh, uh, learning about the world around us. Some of the, these relate to all areas of the curriculum. Uh, as the titles come up, you might like to sort of see whether they match to the pictures. They overlap, of course, but Earth in space, life on land, a watery planet, weather and climate, food farming, jobs, energy and transport. These are all topics and themes which uh, also resonate with the SDGs and indeed with the Earth Charter, which provides a values base. Uh, so all these different sorts of topics uh, enable us to explore uh, the world today and are the sort of things which may give us a more integrated and different, uh, we, we want to argue, open up the curriculum to new thinking. It isn't a matter of throwing out geography or history or any of the established disciplines. If the question is, how can the established dis disciplines uh, contribute to a, re a revised or a, a repositioned curriculum that is going to provide uh, and equip children better for the world that they're going to be living in in the years to come. And one of the things which helps an awful lot here is overarching ideas and concepts. Again, these are completely cross-curricular and just flash a few up on the screen. Concepts such as care, social justice, empathy, You'll see that some of these immediately suggest history link as well, don't they? Interaction, uh, pattern, cycles, change, cultural diversity. These are the sort of concepts that we've been playing around with uh, in order to explore what a, 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 a curriculum of the future might begin to focus on. But this is a, a, a vibrant and ongoing discussion and lots of, there are lots of different voices. UNESCO have come in recently with some thoughts from their Berlin Declaration, which are really quite interesting and valuable. So what role can history take in all this? Uh, that, that's the, the, I've contextualized it. Uh, I just haven't got space in this talk to go into any depth, but I just focus on three key events in history, which I think uh, really uh, shed a light on how we got to where we are today, question number one. The first one is the agricultural revolution and the move from living as hunter-gatherers uh, are living 
nomadic existence to a settled existence, plowing the soil and uh, beginning to uh, uh, be able to uh, 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 plant crops, uh, build cities and uh, beginning to ac accumulate a certain amount of surplus which can then be used in different ways. And that idea of using the land uh, and extracting uh, 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 wealth from it in the sense of food and uh, resources is, is one that is can be explored in lots of different dimensions. It's, it's in a way it's represented in the very work, first work of literature in the Gilgamesh epic and um, the story of Enkadu and how he, the wild man from the hills as it were, uh, how he is tamed is part of what can be seen as a metaphor for the agricultural revolution. But equally, this whole process of tilling the land and settled agriculture um, resonates uh, with a, a story that goes right through um, our history. Um, Lynn White has got a very interesting uh, take on this when she argues that it, in Anglo-Saxon times, it was the eight plow, uh, the oxen, eight oxen pulling a plow that enabled much deeper tilling to take place, which uh, fundamentally changed the relationship between people and the land and put people at the point where they were exploiting and explo extracting from the soil much more than they actually needed. And she also uh, 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 explores that in terms of the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition, uh, which uh, talks, when she talks about uh, uh, that's that particular tradition being uh, strongly anthropogenic uh, uh, and placing humans above the rest of creation in a way that has separated us from nature. So the agricultural revolution opens the door to understanding a very long history of how we relate to the world around us and food. You know, coming back to a classroom level, food is one of those topics which resonates uh, and opens up uh, 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 lots of thinking on a, from children, very young children onwards. So if we take this agricultural revolution that starts uh, uh, in the Fertile Crescent, uh, we can look at it now today with uh, 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 carbon powered tractors doing deep tilling, turning over what looks like incredibly heavy soil. Uh, the, uh, we know that the state of the uh, soil is, 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 is not what it should be that we've extracted uh, and uh, not caring for the soil, we've extracted much more from it uh, than it can possibly uh, sustain in the long term. And I can see that around here where I live on the chalk, chalk downlands and, and just go up the road and the fields are absolutely littered with uh, flints and uh, clearly shouldn't, can only grow crops uh, with the addition of huge quantities of fertilizer. And what we're learning now is that uh, those fertilizers are getting very much more expensive because uh, uh, again, they come from a, 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 pet, a petrol a fossil fuel base apart from anything else. So agricultural revolution, very interesting story and matched or sort of complemented perhaps by the industrial revolution, uh, which is uh, often dated to the sort of 1850s or whatever, when it really sort of takes off. Um, and we didn't know at the time. I mean, when I went to Colebrookdale, I was I was just struck by what how small scale the, the furnaces were and what a little... Uh, 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 event it was in ter landscape terms. And yet over 200 years, whatever happened in the furnaces of Coalbrookdale and the valleys there has spread over the world and has m exponentially uh, in terms of impact. And there's a sense in which uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have the global perspective. Uh, it, you can see it as a sort of Faustian pact. You'll remember that Faustus uh, sells his soul to the devil uh, in return for untold riches. And without knowing it, you know, the question provocatively perhaps here is, have we or did we sell our souls to the devil in terms of uh, oil and fossil fuel production and burning coal without realizing what the consequences were going to be? And are we now at the point of reckoning and a time when we, uh, you know, sort of uh, have to, uh, where are, we're going to be called to account and are finding ourselves called to account by nature. So the Industrial Revolution, and the story of the Industrial Revolution and how it develops gives us another very rich vein, as does colonialism, which again is about extracting wealth from the from the from different parts of the world, not through burning fossil fuels, but by plantation agriculture and by extra, uh, exploiting land in uh, around the New World. And um, there's a 
Alison and I have had a wonderful conversation around Amitav Ghosh's book, uh, The Nutmeg's Curse, which uh, traces the history of plantation agriculture and modern colonialism and imperialism uh, from the Spice Islands of Indonesia uh, through very strongly through what happened in the US and, uh, and, and North America uh, through to the present day. Uh, and uh, concludes with uh, a sentence which I can't quite remember exactly, but along the lines of, to anybody who's half awake, especially young people, extractive capitalism is on its last legs. And it's a very powerful book and uh, one that if you've not looked at it, it I, I find it inspiring. It certainly uh, got me thinking in all sorts of ways. So um, three big themes in history, which enable us to understand why we're at, we, how we got to where we are today and what it means for education. What role can geography take in all this? Well, here's a few, again, a few quick thoughts. Um, geographers focus on place. We focus on the local as well as the distant and uh, exploring the ch child's own environment is hugely valuable in terms of developing their sense of belonging, in terms of developing their sense of identity, in terms of celebrating their own experience and valuing them. There are so many messages that come out of that. Um, Macy, uh, Joanna Macy makes the point that if we don't love something, we're not going to care for it. And it is by uh, exploring it that we get to, uh, in, in that way that uh, we have a powerful a motivator for uh, and a powerful way of, of, of beginning to uh, love it more deeply. Um, ways in which we do this, well, uh, the geography community has, uh, hasn't really improved on Michael Storm's question. Michael Storm was an earlier inspector in the 80s, the late 80s, early 90s, but five questions. What's this place like? Why is this place as it is? How did it come to be as it were? How is it connected to other places? How is this place changing? And what would it feel like uh, to be here? Those sort of questions take us and open up all sorts of inquiries uh, and their experiential inquiries and their inquiries are, which involve imagination as well, curiosity and imagination as well as uh, analytical uh, 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 investigation of, of the environment itself. So investigating place, special places, another one of geographers uh, and geographies um, trump cards, which. Uh, uh, overlaps very strongly now with a picture like that immediately makes you think forest schools uh, but uh, what are the special places uh, for children again this is a child's eye view of the world and one which we can explore in lots of different ways with children and it's uh, uh, opportunity there are opportunities for getting them to to map uh, what they see as well as what they uh, you know, represent their experience graphically as well as representing it uh, in language uh, through uh, things such as haikus and poems and again the opportunity uh, to represent it um, in, in, in numerically all sorts of possibilities special places uh, resonate um, as geographers we're interested in social trends and the way that people live their lives the way that cities are expanding the way that leisure is changing uh, the movement of people all those sort of things come out and that takes us both from the local into the global. One of the things that geographers can do is to uh, uh, vary scale. And that bringing the global scale into understanding uh, uh, our predicament and our place in the world is a uniquely, I would argue, what is something that geography can uniquely bring to the table, as it were, in, in its skill set, just as it can bring in uh, cartography. So if you look at this one, for example, temperature change in the last 50 years, uh, the best way to show temperature change in the last 50 years, I would argue, would be through some sort of cartographic device, some sort of visual. Uh, you would find it incredibly tedious and imperfect in, in to try and describe everything that you can take in on a, from an image like that, which is showing both places where the temperature's decreased, places where it's increased massively, the differences between continents, all those sorts of things can immediately be, be drawn out of that. So it's something that can be interrogated. That's the sort of thing which uh, our, our geographers can really excel in, I think, when it comes to exploring the world that we're living in today. Uh, a little quote from the geographer, the map as the distinctive visual expression of the geographical imagination. And so, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story and it's a great way to do it. So 
there is no planet B. You know, this is this is where we are. This is uh, our place in the in the universe. And I got. An, uh, I've decided to use a quote here from a Soviet astronaut at a particular moment as we uh, uh, grapple with uh, international relations. To have a quote from a Soviet astronaut, Alexei Leonov, who says here that the Earth, as seen from his space capsule, was so light blue and so touchingly alone, our home that must be defended like a holy relic. One of the surprising things in a way that came out of the early astronauts in the 1960s when they saw the Earth from space is that sense that the Earth is an enclosed unit, that it's a, a sphere floating in the darkness uh, alone in a huge void of darkness. And it's a remarkable planet to live on. And we're extraordinarily lucky uh, to have inherited a planet with a great diversity more uh, within the last 15,000 years, it had more uh, biological diversity than any other point in its uh, 4,600 million year history. Uh, so we've inherited a wonderful world and this is the world that we need to live in and to find ways of living there within that planet with, justifies our you know, living within our planetary limit and you know, actually supporting people in the best way that we can. That's the challenge. And it's, it's the story, the big story of the time. And education in different ways uh, 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 is, is, is one of the key vehicles for exploring that. So I'm just going to conclude with uh, uh, some thoughts here about uh, stories. And of course, historians are particularly good at using stories in, in a powerful way, as well as uh, factual accounts. But here's um, Thomas Berry, a theologian, saying, uh, we're between stories, uh, this old story, the account of how we came to be and how we fit in it is no longer effective. The world, we don't have that new story. I think what Thomas Berry is uh, saying there is something which is we've now realized that the world we thought we lived in is no longer the world we're actually living in. And the discoveries of uh, around sustainability, the uh, perspectives, particularly from ecologists and ecology and the science community have alerted us to this. But I would want to argue that it's the humanities which is going to provide uh, the, uh, the deeper and more lasting response. The scientists can tell us what the problem is. Um, Schumacher, um, Ernst Schumacher, who the author, author of uh, Small is Beautiful, uh, has a, a telling phrase he's here. He says, the scientists are not going to tell us uh, what we can do with our lives, what must we do with our lives. That's going to come from the humanities. It's going to come from a, a, a fusion of historical, geographical, and uh, uh, religious pers belief perspectives. What, what is it that we must do with our lives and can do with our lives? And in a sense, isn't that what education is about? Exploring what helping young children uh, to develop what might be encapsulated and thought of as a life message. You know, what is the life message that children are taking from their schooling and from their primary years in particular? And here's an, uptake on the, uh, an update on this. We don't yet have a new story. Each of us is aware of some of the threads. Here we see there are patterns and designs and emerging parts of the fabric, but the new mythos hasn't yet formed. We will abide for a time in the space between stories. It's a very precious, some may say sacred time. I think that's a lovely thought that, you know, this is a time of turbulence. This is a time when we could easily uh, uh, get uh, over depressed by uh, the prospects because of the, uh, we know that uh, we're in a difficult place, a very difficult place. But the idea that we're in the space between stories and that it is a very special time, it turns that whole uh, uh, narrative round. So key challenges. Ensuring that teachers, and this is just strips off the tongue, but it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Have the knowledge and confidence to help children understand difficult issues. And so as somebody who's worked in teacher education for many years, I, I know the, the difficulties on the ground. Uh, recognizing the interconnected nature of sustainability education and how individual disciplines, history, geography, and all the others, each make a unique contribution to it. I think that's a really interesting discussion and one that perhaps we haven't had enough. Uh, developing new ideas about curriculum organization, school subjects and timetables and the way in which 
uh, uh, it takes us into progression, I suspect, in a big way, but also about the, the diversity of schooling and the importance of responding to individual contexts and circumstances. And uh, we don't know quite, again, how to do this, but embedding practical action, uh, because one of the things we say about sustainability education is that it's one thing to learn about what's going on, but what does this actually mean for what we do? And so uh, how do we find meaningful responses and certainly as a teacher educator it's you know it's fine for me to uh, run a session on these sort of problems and then the student comes up and says I'm really I really want to do something what is it that I can actually do so uh, getting that into a better focus uh, I, I've got I make no pretense that uh, we've got the answers but what I think both Steve Rawlinson and I are seeing is all sorts of different initiatives all sorts of things going on which are really exciting and which suggest uh, that, um, yes, there are people in all sorts of different ways coming up with very creative solutions, very interesting approaches in lots of different ways. And it's a bit like the bubbles in that screen. And what we need to do is to see that those bubbles coalesce and gradually become, or hopefully quickly become, a critical movement and a critical mass for change. And if that is where we're heading, then that's a very encouraging uh, place to be. Uh, heading towards and, and, and it, it, it takes us into a, a much better future. So may, that's why I call the uh, uh, talk Making Connections and so on. And I hope that's somewhere in different ways uh, that's uh, sort of triggered some thoughts in your mind or uh, you know, sort of op let's open up the opportunity now for discussion, which I guess, Alison, you're going to choreograph. Is that right? I will. <clears throat> and thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I just wanted to say what a, a model that was of clarity and and clear structure as well as clear communication. Um, uh, I, I think we're happy to have you here as an honorary historian as well as a, a geographer, Stephen. To be honest. <laughs> thank so. you very much. I, <laughs> I, I, did, did it come with a certificate? <laughs> I look forward to the certificate. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to look in the chat, but... Um, do you, do you want to take questions and steer me a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So um, please do, if anyone has a question of Stephen, pop it in the chat or um, or just um, put your hand up and, and ask it yourself. It's a relatively small group, so we can do that. Um, uh, perhaps while people are thinking or typing, um, I could I could jump in, Stephen. I mean, what, yes. one, is, one is actually a, a comment, really, just um, thinking about some of those um, geographical concepts or ideas of place and special places um and and social trends and and just thinking how similar that is to history in many ways i mean we come at it from a from a different angle but um as as many of you know myself and michael riley are actually writing some materials at the moment to support history teachers uh, in embedding an environmental perspective and one of the things that michael and i are trying to do is to to take exactly that notion of place and special place um, uh, you know, thinking about the lost rainforests of of England that Guy Shrubshole has has talked about, and you know, wonderful, quite magical places, um, and and getting inviting young people to connect with that as well as 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 special places on their own doorstep. And I think we can learn a bit from the geographers in that, if I'm honest. Um, and that I, I know. Yeah. I was going to say, Alison, I think we can learn from each other, and that's the that's the important thing. Is it, and, I mean, geography, if you trace it back etymologically, means geographia or earth writing. So it's about telling, I, there's one I trot out quite regularly because it does make such good sense. It's about telling the story of the earth. And, you know, we, we are all doing that in our different disciplines in different ways. And that last quote about new narratives, you know, what is the story that we're telling? Why do we think that's the right story? Or how many stories are there? Uh, can we contrast them and compare them and, 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 and develop them and make the story the one that we need, find the story that we need for the current circumstances? Uh, we have a discussion amongst geographers, as I suspect you do amongst historians, as to you know the extent to which your subject may be diluted by external influences and that sort of sense in which you want to keep clear boundaries and you don't want your your history has something very distinctive to contribute geography has something very distinctive to contribute but i don't think that needs to be eroded by uh cooperation and collaboration across subject boundaries 
And I say, I think if we ask the question is, how does this help us to understand how we got to our present predicament? How does it help us to understand uh, what children can take away as their life message from their education? Uh, then it changes the whole um, tone of the discussion. I know we've got some primary educators um, uh, apart from Stephen in in the in the virtual room. I don't know whether this is something any any primary educators want to comment on because I think uh, this 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 notion of of spotting the, the the very clear connections between history and geography is arguably easier in primary context and secondary context. I don't know whether anyone's got examples of that that they can share with us. Not wanting to put any particular person on the spot, of course, but. I'll just let you perhaps ponder that uh, for a moment. But um, Gary, can I can I pick on you for a minute? Because just just going back to my point about place and landscapes and local landscapes and so on, you've been thinking about this quite a lot, I think. Yeah. First of all, um, Stephen, um, thank you very much. I mean, that was I echo everything Alison said about the talk. It was masterful and really um, thoughtful. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm experimenting at the moment with the idea of how um, space place changes over time and doing that very much as a kind of palimpsest idea and, and working with images and, and trying to get pupils to experience that change in um, place and, and really doing that through um, virtual technology. Um, I've been involved in a project which is allowed pupils to walk into photographs um, and walk around inside the photograph. Um, this has been mainly to do with some work with colleagues in the history department here at Nottingham. Um, but we're just beginning to experiment with the idea of using that in relation to landscape and place and picking certain landscapes where we see significant change, significant developments. And the technology is allowing us to walk into those spaces and actually use, I suppose, both geographical skills, but also historical skills there and historical sources to um, reimagine the landscape during previous times and actually challenge themselves to whether that reimagination process um, links to the evidence. So it's an early stage project at the moment, but um, you know, it, 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 it it has potential, I think, to actually show pupils the impact of, of, um, of, of sort of ecological change and therefore link into those other themes as well. So um, I'll willingly, re willingly report back on this at another occasion when we've done a bit more work around it, but at the moment it's still in its, not its infancy, it's growing quite quickly, but we are, um, we still got a lot to do on it. Can I just, while I'm on, can I just make one other quick, um, observation. It struck me in your talk, Stephen, that um, one of the key challenges here, particularly for us as teacher educators, is around this idea of how do we enable teachers to um, move pupils in direction where taking action is an acceptable part of what we're doing. And, and I do find this particularly challenging, particularly um, um difficult to to sort of think about how we actually put in place training materials education materials that allow teachers to do that because it strikes us that we we never never really had to do that in fact we shy we've shied away from this at different stages mm -hmm. and different topics and it does strike me that this is a particular challenge and i, I you know i'm opening this up for wider conversation amongst people on the call about how you know, is there work going on that really is thinking about the roots of what we're doing in, in training pro, um, teacher education programs about how we do that? How do we move teachers' thinking where it's, it becomes acceptable to us young people to, <clears throat> excuse me, take action? I don't know if anybody else in the group is going to come back on that or whether you want me to say something. Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll say something well, shall I, Alison? Or, yeah, I think I think jump in there, Stephen. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, firstly, the first point about the about the landscape, I'd just like to comment on that, Tom, because I think it's fascinating. I was um, brought up on Hoskins and the clearance of the English landscape, uh, which I gather, you know, was happening from the Anglo-Saxon, the woodlands were being cut down from the Anglo-Saxon times onwards, as it were, and to discover the changes in the landscape happened thousands of years earlier than that. In, in, whole scale 
forest clearance and so on is really I, I found it very quite found it a very difficult um, readjustment and I think actually being able to imagine past landscapes is really really interesting and of course you can take that to the present day where you've got the uplands of of northern England and Scotland and so on, which somebody like George Monbiot would say this is a desert. You know, this was once rich woodland. This was once Atlantic forests. Look at it now. The sheep have actually, uh, actually, uh, you know, they're such a menace. They've done so much damage. So, you know, that opens up. It's a fascinating uh, take, you know, the way the history can actually uh, shed a light on what we're seeing now and how we interpret it. So coming on to the action, I find this a tricky area. Uh, it's a, a bit of a mantra that, you know, sort of sustainability work should lead to something practical. And the, there are safe things like the school garden, uh, the litter pick, which are the safe things. But if you're going to actually do anything meaningful, it can very easily lead in, uh, straight into a political uh, issue where students may well feel that they need to be taking direct action. And there is a, uh, uh, you know, so you can see that how letting the, you know, sort of create the, it's a bit like creativity. Creativity is an unruly and difficult force to have in the classroom. In many ways, you don't want your children to be too creative because it becomes a nightmare. <laughs> but finding a way in which creativity can flourish in the classroom is a skill that teachers have over the over the centuries have really perfected, I think. And it's that's the trick. But how you pull that off with action uh, is much harder. Uh, but clearly some sort of balance and the avoidance of extremism and the recognition that there are reasonable bounds and not being al allowing to, um, to, too much binary thinking and uh, a descent into, you know, sort of simplistic and extremist uh, sort of, the sort of problems that we get in the echo chambers of, of social media, trying to avoid that sort of, there are, Clearly, clearly those are, are, are danger areas, but that doesn't answer the question at all. Can, can I just come in there? I, I won't say too much because we've got some questions in the chat, but uh, I've also been thinking about this. And um, uh, it seems to me that there's quite a broad definition of what action might look like. Yes. Um, an action could be, I'm just thinking of Michael Young's and, and, and Joe Muller's work about powerful knowledge and, and in one of their articles they talk about the power of 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 social studies history etc of helping people contribute to the conversation society has about itself and and for me one of the things history does is empowers young people to to contribute to those debates <laughs> about ourselves um I, i'm not sure that's quite action but it is empowering them isn't it to to make a contribution and in in a way that sort of action or some kind of agency i think mm. um right we've got some questions in the chat um uh, stephen um tom do you want to ask your question it'd be nice to hear your voice i think yes um i certainly i in the chat, I referred to uh, Amitav Ghosh's in um, Nutmeg's Curse, and he talk, talks about um, the colonialist viewpoint and the influence of colonialism and, and how that negated uh, and, and suppressed um, indigenous knowledge, indigenous perspectives. And, uh, and there's certainly a number of people now, indigenous scholars, especially in Canada, who 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 ask us to take seriously some of this idea that of the land is sentient that we if we we listen to glaciers if we we understand we we show um through ceremony perhaps and through honoring the the, the salmon and the, the fish and the land and the and the idea of tree the trees as as um as being beings um so uh as apart from lots of practical uh, ideas about uh, managing fires and the like um so i'm uh, just interested in your comment and how that fits into the um out, the, you know very engaging and and uh, thoughtful outline of uh, how we might create new stories mm. yeah it's a fascinating um and very rich um area indigenous knowledge it's a difficult one to know quite what you can draw from it again as a historian you'll want we'll want to look at it 
uh, with a certain amount of caution and not have rose-colored glasses and think, well, you know, indigenous people lived in, in harmony with the land when they may not have done, but just small, just their impact was very small because of the way that they lived and their numbers were smaller. So I, I want to approach with a certain amount of caution while recognizing the, the wisdom of, of different cultures and the importance of diversity and the importance of diverse voices. But I suppose the my take on, on it can come from a different angle. Like if you look at Gaia theory, one of the, you know, the, the extraordinary things about Gaia theory was that it alerted us to the way in which rocks and the physical planetary surface of the planet, which appears to be, or had been regarded as inert basically, and uh, is actually part of a cycle and interacts chemically and, and dynamically with, with the atmosphere uh, and is, uh, creates the condition in which life can flourish. And actually, you know, the, the boundary between rocks and, 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 and life forms and sentient beings is not as decisive and clear cut as we've always thought. And that idea that there are different forms of understanding, different forms of being comes across nowadays in the way that we're beginning to understand that the way that trees communicate with each other, for example. An idea that you know comes in from the cold, as it were, and sounded wacky, uh, maybe ten or twenty years ago, is now becoming much more mainstream as people recognise that the microcausal uh, connections and so on uh, enable trees uh, to actually uh, alert each other to danger. What an extraordinary idea! So the whole sense in which the world around us is animate rather than inert is there in the indigenous cultures, and I think it's a, a great uh, way in. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think we should wrap up. I've just got a, an eye on, on the time. I just wanted to point out in the chat, um, Ailsa has reminded us of some work that she did on Wangari Matai. Um, mm -hmm. Ailsa's written a lovely article on that in Primary History, and she presented at it, uh, about it at the HA conference last year. It's a really good example of links between subjects and how subjects can work together. So I recommend that. Um, thanks, Ilona, for the... Um, uh, reference to return of a native. Um, I've heard really good things about that from a number of people. Um, so it's going to be yet another book on my pile of unread books um, that I will get round to eventually. Um, and Connor, I'm really sorry we haven't got time for your question, but it's a good question around how can schools create the space to think in cross-disciplinary ways? Uh, I, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a really mm. important question. Um, just mm. to remind you, uh, if you haven't looked already, I'll put the link in the chat again. If you do want to, to consider joining um, a thematic group, no, no, um, uh, you don't need to, you don't have to, it's entirely optional, uh, but if you would like to do pop your name down on there. And just to say our next meeting with us with a speaker is on the 25th of May. Glenn, did you want to say something really briefly about who's speaking at that, just so we know? Uh, yes, so there's two climate scientists that work at the University of Northern British Columbia who've done global studies